When General Johnson spoke, everybody listened. <laughs> you want to get things done. I think there's a direct translation from the kind of standards the general had at the company to what you see in the Robert Johnson Foundation. The basic mission of the foundation is fundamentally the same as it was when he started it, which is to improve the health and health care of all Americans. Do you consider yourself an academic, a doctor, or an activist? Yes. <laughs> One of the things that the general felt passionately about is that we at the foundation have programs that address the needs of the most vulnerable in society. We have to be attendant to not only health care, but also the social determinants of health. Things like where people live. Is it smog filled? Are they getting high quality education? Getting kids to have a healthy start makes a huge difference. In terms of eliminating disparities in health, that has been a major goal of the Robert Johnson Foundation since the beginning. The government is still not adequately funding public health. And I think one of the most important roles that a foundation can play is to be ahead of the curve and developing models that government can later then put more resources in. It's had a tremendous impact on policy in this country. We see ourselves as being in the information business and trying to make sure that policymakers have the information that they need to make the best choices for the American people. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. The foundation knew it wanted to make a really seismic change in tobacco control. And they set out to do it, not just funding the campaign for tobacco for kids, but funding state coalitions, funding research. When the history of tobacco control is written in this country, the foundation is going to be in every chapter. We made a commitment to invest uh, a half a billion dollars in reversing the epidemic of childhood obesity. These kids are going to have a burden of illness that is unparalleled to what we've seen before. Getting people to understand that this is not just about the health of children, that those children are going to grow up, and you know what, eventually many of them are going to wind up on Medicaid or Medicare or public programs, and we're all going to be paying the bill. In the early days, they used to say, if you're not getting the word out, then you're not going to create social change. They recognize that the communications function is a critically important piece of the work that they do in order to produce change. The foundation has a megaphone that no one else has. They have the ability to bring people to the table, know what, what we call the best practices are, and spread them through the healthcare system. Nursing is always there. He always had a tremendously high regard for, for nursing. The general felt they were undervalued. I can't think of any other organization that's saying, what's the equation here? The equation for quality and health care is nurses. Nurses are critical to this outcome. Um, how do we position them to do the best that they can do? And how do we position all the decision makers to make sure that they're investing in them to accomplish that goal? Over the course of the Foundation's history, we've made a tremendous investment in people. I'm a product of that human capital commitment. I feel deeply about the things that I'm doing. It grows out of my own background, you know, growing up on a farm in Alabama where we didn't have access to health care. When you impact upon the lives of people in terms of training and development or leadership development, is one of the most important ways to stimulate social change. Real change takes place in a community. The foundation made a very big decision, I think, and said, we know that these disparities exist. We want to fix it. I spent day last week in Cincinnati. They have more and more people in Cincinnati for whom English is not their first language. We are bringing them a toolkit that's been proven already to make sure they have high quality services in the patient's language. That's huge. When this foundation got started, it looked as if universal health care coverage was right around the corner. We're still waiting for the corner. 
We live in a country where anywhere from 46 to 47 million people are uninsured. What we want to do with our work in coverage is make sure that, plain and simple, everyone has basic, affordable health care coverage. When America has periodically tried to address this problem, when forces have been beaten back, when political consensus has failed, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has kept the flame alive. We have a team that we call the Pioneer Team. Which is a way to bring non-traditional ideas into the foundation. The foundation is definitely on the cutting edge of healthcare, ranging from flu prediction markets or games for people in hospitals, in our particular case, antibiotics. So the field I work in is primarily in bringing tools from environmental economics to look at health problems. It's pretty rare for foundations to stick their neck out ahead of the curve, so to speak. The 911 system exists because of an early grant the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation gave to an ambulance corps. Which proved that if you had trained personnel, if you had a single number, lives were saved. When you have a great cause, a great mission, then you really attract talented people. Then you can move mountains. The world in America would be much poorer places without the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. It's made a very important decision that we're going to measure what we do and say, we see a problem, now we're going to find a solution. That's the promise of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation.